Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Uh, man, this Bill Willingham Fables public domain story continues to be incredibly interesting. If you need to catch up, uh, I guess things have broken down between DC and uh, Willingham. Of course, DC, the parent company of Vertigo, where Fables ran for over 150 issues, if you include Jack of Fables and the Cinderella stories and so many other uh, miniseries that came from the Fables universe. And um, I guess, uh, you know, uh, Willingham has some ownership. DC obviously has the full rights to uh, everything that was published under Vertigo and DC regarding Fables. Willingham is a little angry. Uh, he has uh, put forth a couple series, and I guess either DC is holding back in publishing them or getting the projects completed, and Bill is fed up. So he declared that um, people can now use the Fable characters uh, in public domain uh, capacity, I guess. If I'm not saying the right words. But you know what I'm saying. Um, and I get, you know, obviously these are public domain characters to start with, but you could put the Fable spin on them. So you could do a Big B Wolf story and you could have Rose Red and Snow White in it the way they are depicted in Fables. Or Cinderella being a spy and all the other uh, different uh, angles of Fables that go beyond uh, the basic fairy tales. Interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see how things uh, uh, certainly uh, spin out of this. Um, God, even publishers like Ben Dunn uh, from Antarctic Press has even said that's intriguing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to all shake out. Regardless, what I do have to present to you today to give you a better feel for the Fables universe, if you don't already have it, is a panel that I did at uh, the old Cincy Comic Con that uh, Tony Moore uh, used to put on, and it was a great show, and I got to do a lot of those as a moderator. And this is a writers panel for Fables, featuring Bill, Chris Robertson. And Lila Sturgis. I should point out that this is before Lila transitioned, and this is back when uh, Lila was still Matthew Sturgis. Matthew wrote uh, Jack of Fables, so uh, you know. Again, you'll if you hear that, I don't want anyone to be offended. This is at a time when Matthew was still a male, so just pointing that out for clarification. And I really appreciated this conversation. It isn't your average length panel. It went uh, well over an hour, and I'm happy to present it to you today. The Fables Writers Panel, featuring Chris Robertson, Lila Sturgis, and Bill Willingham, on today's Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by my followers, the League of Word Balloon Listeners. That's the name I gave my uh, followers uh, through Patreon. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Listen, things are tough this year. I won't deny it for me, uh, financially. If you've ever considered supporting Word Balloon, I could really use your help. So uh, if you think Word Balloon is worth the price of a comic book, uh, even a dollar a month would be greatly appreciated. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thank you very much for your uh, patronage and your attention, the League of Word Balloon listeners. If you uh, subscribe to Word Balloon, I will send you an email that will have a domino mask and cape and a nice League of Word Balloon uh, listeners emblem that uh, you've seen here on Word Balloon as well. But uh, thank you for your support. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex has been a longtime sponsor of Word Balloon. I greatly appreciate it. you got to go to his website. You will find tremendous art from original work, covers, pages, fantastic lithographs, amazing posters. Every price point is covered, and every subject is covered at alexrossart.com. You've enjoyed his iconic looks at DC and Marvel, but also great stuff like his wonderful work on the monkeys, Monty Python, so many other great pop culture things that Alex has put his fingerprints on. His wonderful Flash Gordon poster that evokes the fantastic Dino De Laurentiis, Sam Jones movie. Recently, Alex did things like uh, the timeless Marvel covers featuring great solo shots of all your favorite Marvel heroes. And of course, his Fantastic Four full circle graphic novel still available. All waiting for you now at alexrossart.com. 
Let's go back to last month's Cincy Comic Con, where uh, one of the highlights of the weekend was a great panel about fables. Uh, it featured the writers Bill Willingham, the creator of Fables, Matthew Sturgis, the creator of uh, Jack of Fables, and um, Chris Robertson, who wrote the Cinderella miniseries that they did, several of them. And uh, they uh, have just done excellent work in the Fables universe and uh, created uh, really one of the more distinct Vertigo titles of the 21st century. you got to hand it to the guys. It was an amazing run. Great artists, of course, Mark Buckingham and uh, the like, and we talk about them as well, all the various contributors to Fables and Jack of Fables and Cinderella. But uh, this is a great opportunity to get the three writers together and get their thoughts as things were winding down. Matthew Sturgis was still writing Wolf in the Fold, the digital and print comic based on the uh, Fables video game. But uh, like I said, great chance to talk to these guys as they say goodbye after 150 issues of Fables. I forget how many uh, trades of Jack of Fables and uh, at least two or three of, uh, of Cinderella. So pretty neat run for the Fables universe. Let's hear from the creators themselves now on the Fables panel from Cincy Comic Con to wrap things up on today's Word Balloon. Does anybody know how they got the... Uh the visual effect of the red set of Krypton in the opening sequence of Superman the movie. No, no. It's a, it, it's a paint can. They have like stuff in paint can. Gasoline. Gasoline. Oh, that's yes. awesome. Give that man a... Here, yeah, Chip. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's a... Oh, you know, guys, yeah, we do. Uh, well, what they are they're is... Right. They're pirate coins that you could turn in for raffle chip, uh, chips for the auction that happens after this panel. So, you'll forgive me, the panel ran late. And if I can real fast, I'm going to hit the washer real fast, then I'm okay. sure it'll be quick. Chris Roberson actually came up with us, but he has this policy of always making an entrance late for a panel. So he's, there you go. he's waiting outside in order to show up late. All right, how about the, the sound effect of the blasters from Star Wars? Do you know where that sound, that sound effect came from? Take the hammer to the, the, the stay wire for, uh, for uh, like telephone poles or power poles. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> all my stuff is old, like what three sounds go into the Tarzan yell and things like that. That's the old stuff. That's Johnny so Five stuff. I know. I, I am. I'm a very old man. But, uh, like, Star Wars and Superman both came out, you know, almost forty years ago. Yes, and that's still newfangled stuff to me. That's how old I am. I'm back. Oh, look, you got I'm going to take the oh. point. Not that I don't trust that. Oh. I wasn't handing them out. Oh. I'm, still not, I'm still only vaguely sure what these are good for. Well, like I said, no, you turn them in for raffle tickets. Oh, okay. And then there's a raffle right after our panel yeah. and the art auction. And so uh, the potential is there. So, yeah, if you have questions, although, as I said, Aaron, I'll officially start. <clears throat> so, why doesn't Hitler drink tequila? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Makes a <it> meme. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, okay. No, um, welcome to this spoiler free celebration of fables and I'm very excited about this because I too am a fables fan and I had knocked my socks off from issue one and uh, I'm sorry that it's wrapping up although I know there are post fables plans and everything but sure very happy to have on the panel uh, the writers behind this wonderful phenomenon uh, we've got Chris Robertson check and see if he's wearing socks is he me or you I yeah, he's lying. He, he did not get his off. You can put it back on. Oh, that's okay. true. All right. So, but we have Chris Robertson, everybody. <laughs> Matthew Sturgis. <laughs> and uh, the, the father of fables himself, Bill Williams. <laughs> and my name's John Saunders. I host a podcast called Word Balloon. I've had some of these men on, on my show separately and hope to have them again in the future. But it's great to have them collectively. And, and talk about this wonderful phenomenon. And Bill, we should start with, with you and the genesis of fables. The genesis of fables. Um, okay, I'll, I'll do the serious end of it. Um, I've been writing folklore and fables-esque characters into all my funny books regardless. I mean, uh, 
Bill Nettles was supposed to be a superhero book, and they kept putting folklore characters into it. Um, and uh, they've been sneaking into everything else. So on one level at least, Fables was just letting that other shoe drop, admitting to myself that apparently this is what I like writing. So why don't we just formally adopt that as a uh, premise uh, uh, for a story? Um, I, I liked, uh, I was doing things like that leading up to it, uh, and it just sort of finally, you know, fell into place. Um, it's such a boring genesis in the sense of, I mean, the, the well, did you go to Vertigo or did, or did, did, did they come to you and say something? Because as you said, then you had that success in the 80s and 90s here's, with a lot of different things. Yeah, here's how it ended up with Vertigo is uh, I was doing work for Vertigo Comics. Uh, much of my stuff was getting critical uh, success, but no sales. I was selling sometimes in the high dozens. Um, <laughs> so I had a string of things that were pre-canceled uh, before the first one came out. Um, and uh, with Fables, I was working on something else. I did not think it was a Vertigo book uh, because Vertigo at the time at least was a lot of pouty lip teenagers rebelling on scooters with lip piercings. And I, you know, God bless, I love how do you teenager rebelling on scooters with lip piercing books? I just am not capable of writing one. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll work on this and I'll find some publisher for it. And uh, Shelley Bond, the editor of Fables and the editor of, of my work for Vertigo at the time was on the phone with me trying to pitch me the idea of pitching her a series. Shelley Bond gets ideas and then goes and tries to find a writer to pitch them to her. Um, and then, feels no obligation to actually accept the book. But, <laughs> but that's neither here, here nor there. Don't even bring that up again. Um, we were talking about this other thing where she wanted two sassy female detectives in New York. And I didn't really have a two sassy female detectives in New York story in me, but she was trying hard. And I go, this is great, Shelley, but I gotta hang up now because I, I wanna finish up this proposal for a, a new series. And she got very territorial and said, what new series? And I explained, Shelley, this is not a very good thing. And I explained fables, etc. in, in, in uh, brief. And she says, yeah, that's a Virgo series. And you're uh, submitting it to me by Monday. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to accept it. Um, for all of her faults, uh, she told no lie there. I got it in by Monday. By the end of the week, they accepted it as a series, which was uh, phenomenal. Um, DC has the record of waiting eight years to accept, finally, a proposed series that was seven issues long. It was called uh, Hammerlock, and it was Chris Sprouse's first work, but it was not his first published work because, well, eight years. Um, so, can I, can I parenthetically ask a question? Yeah. I will be talking to Mike so people can hear. Um, you said that you didn't feel like it was a very good book because of the kind of things that they did. Sure. Um, I'm curious to know, did you, because because Vertigo, was and has been ostensibly mature readers, yes. right? But uh, in the interim, the rest of the line has matured up. So that really, tonally, you don't see a lot of difference between a lot of the superhero titles and a lot of the stuff that's traditionally been Vertigo. That is true. So I know from my experience with a zombie that I was pushed to age it up, to make it more mature, ostensibly. Did, did you do that? Yes. Were you forced to do that? No, I suggested to do that. I was pushed to. Uh, traditionally, you have editors telling you to take the sex and the cussing out of a book, and, and here it was the other way. It's like, could you put more sex and cussing in? Um, and you didn't mind doing that because certainly in your previous work you had well adult things in it. No, but I got it out of my system. I. I I would have been much happier if, if Fables was an all ages thing. Oh, okay. And you moved away from it pretty quick. It I moved away from it as soon as they were looking. In the interim, I've been yelled at by uh, certain people who I, I will not name that says that she never, never pushed me to do that, and that is rewriting history. But anyway. See, I, I had the benefit, on my view, of there were things that Mike Albright would not grow up. Mm. So um, we there was a built in kind of safeguard. And, but there was one time I had a hilarious gag. Um, that Mike was uncomfortable with. Because what was it was, um, uh, well, my daughter's heard me swear. Like, so anyway, um, 
<laughs> so uh, there's a character who's uh, dead, and then it, there's, there's a body under a sheet, and you hear it start making like a little noise, and the noise gets louder, and it, it's it's this, it's it's a fricative, so it's like, and then like no, yeah, or something like that. Anyway, it, anyway, the gag ended with her sitting up right and just screaming fuck, right? Yeah. And uh, Mike had a really serious phone call with me. He called me up and he's like, yeah, I'm really not okay with that. So I had to take, that was the one instance of a four-letter word that would have been in my zombie. Yeah. Yeah. See, now can I inject a parenthetical into your injected parenthetical? <laughs> sure. Because <clears throat> here's, I, and I have to know if you ever did this, you know, like Shelley Bond will often, you know, ask you to include things <laughs> in a story, you know. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering, did you ever use the excuse, well, I would, but Mormon theology prohibits <laughs> that being drawn, and because she would never check. It's I, I should have thought of that. I should have thought of that. <laughs> but it was kind of an interesting, like, I, I mean, did you ever feel this? Because I would have to, like, let's have somebody on a Vespa. Like, all right, so I had to write a scene where someone's on a Vespa in an issue. I don't see a lot there of that. There was a lot of that. There was, uh, Fortunately, a lot of fables uh, escape that. Every once in a while, she'd ask for something. Uh, when I introduced the two dryad characters, she asked if they could have a romance and kiss. And I said, well, it's possible, but they are established right away as brother and sister. So, um, you know, if you want a Lannister sort of thing happening here, but it, so she backed out of that. But, when we would try other projects, since she, it was pretty established earlier on that I that she could not mess with Fable. But she would ask for other things. Remember, we were I, I forget even what we were trying to pitch, and she asked. It was, was called, any, it was called Deep Six Detective. It was a oh, female detective. Yes. Yeah. And she wanted extreme water sports. And, and she just by which she right. meant like people on jet skis. <laughs> oh, that's very clear. We're pretty sure. We're <laughs> pretty sure. Wow, this is an adult. Uh, but she just asked. That. People, oh, yeah, your kids here. I know. Oh, God, it's such a good joke. I know. Come by the table later. <laughs> wow. So anyway, fables got picked up quicker than anything, which is good because that weekend after that Friday, they said, "Yep, we're doing it." I saw the very first. Um, Shrek ad for the first Shrek movie. Okay. And there was everything Fables was going to have right there. Oh, didn't the Tenth Kingdom air right around there too? Well, no, the Tenth Kingdom was before. I, I drew upon the Tenth Kingdom. You know, everyone's saying Fables started the thing. No, 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 no. Fables, I was cashing in on something, a trend I could see happening. Interesting. Okay. But anyway, I would never have said, I, I called them up and said, look, you've probably seen the Shrek ads. Someone beat us to it. I am withdrawing my, my proposal and I will not uh, hold it against you that you don't want to do it now. And they laughed and said, I'm stupid. Uh, that Shrek and Fables will be nothing alike. And it turns out that they really were sure. But I, I, I had that occurred before I finished my proposal, I would, ne I would put it on the shelf and never approach it again because someone beat me to it. Very cool. Yeah. Man. Because, yeah, I, I mean, and certainly, God, I, I feel for you for, you know, Grimm and Once Upon a Time, and certainly what's, what's you know, transpired with those television series, and it's like, well, you know, that's all really cute, but I remember when Fables was being talked about as a potential television series, yeah. and it didn't happen. Who needs a TV series? Well, I, yes, said, said I saw me, I, I respect that. People have TV series made of their comic books are douches. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have more of that talk tomorrow when we have our spotlight on uh, Chris. Uh, but uh, no, I, um, so, so Ben Medina was the original co-creator. I always, it's weird because I'd forgotten that and I assumed it was Bucky. No, well, but yeah, tell me, help, help me. Here's the thing, and this is going to sound evil, and, and perhaps it is, I'm, I'm, I'm too close to it to see all the moral implications. Fables happened just at the time when the, the big to-do over Miracle Man was happening where no one really knew who owned it. And several people were laying claim to all or pieces of it. Yes. And Miracle Man had set uh, uh, dormant for what, 20 years? Something really yes. And I said to myself, a book needs a captain, so I was going to keep the copyright and, and not do a co-creator, so 
uh, Lam and Dina drew the first arc, okay. but I created the characters visually and okay. and uh, written so that there could be a single creator for no, not because I'm greedy and say I'm I'm, I'm I'm all mine, but I realized every every series needed one person who could say we'll do this or we won't do this, and I think I think it works as a template in the sense that Fables has kept many families well paid, well you know whatever for for 13 years, mm -hmm. um, whereas at that time and now it, it's finally been worked through so that Miracle Man is now coming back. But all that time, these, these poor people that were like throwing money and, and uh, my agent was also Neil Gaiman's lawyer for the whole Miracle Man oh, wow. and stuff like that. If you would know the amount of money that was spent to clean up who owns the rights there, and I'm just getting one person struggle on there so it's never, never gonna earn back what was spent the trying. Wow. Well, you, you kept Bucky busy in the meantime. I did. I did. Uh, well, so and, anyway. well, and, 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 and the building on art, and, and, and I get that, and, I, and as, again, no, I, we all acknowledge that, but I, I wondered in terms of the original team, you know, writer and artist, in terms of, uh, I, I, I had forgotten that Lamadino had that first art before, yeah. because I really do associate uh, Bucky's style and framing, literally his framing, as we know from the interiors of Fables. And was that, an like how did that invention happen visually? Well, what happened was, uh, remember at the time before Fables, no one stayed on the book very long. It had been so long since anyone had done that. Yeah, there were a few days like, were over like that. You know, days him stay on service forever, but that was that was uh, the exception to prove the rule. It's just no one did that. So the the idea was, I would write this in arcs, and we would get a different artist for every arc, just like Sandman. Oh, okay. Okay. So I had two arcs finished: uh, the Legends in Exile and Animal Farm, and. <laughs> Shelley and I had a list of artists to go to. Lamadina was one, uh, Bucky was another, and apparently Shelley gave Bucky his choice of which of the two arts he wanted. He was just coming off of Spider-Man, he was tired of drawing buildings, he said, I'll do Animal Farm because it's, it's rural and it's animals. Uh, so he sort of chose to be the second guy I on see. Fable. Okay. But since it was gonna be different artists every art, that really didn't matter. Except that at the end of Animal Farm, Bucky very politely called us up and said, oh, by the way, I'm staying on the series. This is my book. <laughs> and because he's so polite, or at least, see, I don't know that he's not that. It's the accent. accent. It's the accent. I think really is. I'm going to take other people's jobs forever. Yeah, I think, I think he's an evil villain because all the villains have, uh, in movies have English accents. I mean, that's true. And he just used that accent to, you know, it's like, to well, he seems to be sure about, I guess he is the regular artist, because <laughs> why would he say that to us if he wasn't? So, yeah, he, he, just he so made smart. that decision, and then stuck with it for 13 years. Hey, well, that's, we're all happy about that. That's unheard of. No, Archie Buckingham, ladies and gentlemen, who is not here, so in abstention, we, we will applaud his, his efforts on the past 13 years of Fables. And, and truly, and Matthew, when we talk a bit about Jack and everything, I want to talk about the, and, and both of you actually, the Jack creative team as well, because they're amazing. But I, yeah, what I like, the, the core first, and then I, I want to talk about, you know, when, right. when each of you have also contributed to Fables as well. Um, and, you know, while we're on the subject, obviously Steve Lealoa, obviously a beautiful work. Yeah. And, and yeah, whatever you want to say about it, is, is you know, the, their, their combination. They were a wonderful combination. I could not see it at first. Uh, Bucky style and Steve Lailoa style together, but it, it, others could, and it worked wonderfully. And Steve did another surprising thing, which is he stayed on the boat forever. Uh, Steve was there forever. Uh, Todd Klein was there forever. Bucky, Bucky was there forever. Uh, people stayed with the book, and and that is yeah, it, amazing to me. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Todd Klein is the only person who worked on every issue of all of the Fables books. No. Accounting the spinoffs. Because? Because of Wolf Among Us. Which yes. Which he did not like. Oh, oh wow. Wow. Wolf, wow. Among Us. Wolf Among Us broke the Todd Klein record. Oh, yeah. Crazy. But otherwise he lettered absolutely everything. Yeah. So who was that other letter? Um, it's been a couple of people. It was uh, Sal Cipriano, but then he left, and now it's, uh, I can't remember who it is right now. I apologize. Oh, and, no. and, and of course the James Jean covers, good Christ. 
Yeah, and, the stack of, and the stack of Eisner's that said covers, I believe, uh, got over the years. Huh? I got to tell you, he was a godsend. Uh, he is literally the only example I know of the overnight success. Um, you've heard the term, you're an overnight sensation. And the, the response, like once when, when Simonson was, was doing Thor, and someone said to him, I, my very first convention was little me that had done nothing yet. And Simon said, "I'm the little home wall convention, but we got to sit together and act like pros together." Um, someone comes up and says, "Oh, you're an overnight ph phenom." It was Simonson's run on Thor. Which if you've never seen it, it was just terrific, including Frog. And he said something like, "Yeah, it only took me 20 years to become an overnight success." <laughs> and that's usually the case. You don't see the years of trouble. James Dean literally walked out of art school, and I don't. I, yes, you do a lot of work in art school and you prepare, but that is preparing time. That's not. Can I make it time? The next day, he had an appointment to show his stuff around in DC, um, and he was hired by us to do Fables on that day, and just walked into to famous success. And the unfortunate thing is, I'm spacing his name. Esau Andrews. Esau Andrews, who was a wonderful cover artist, and would have gotten hired that day, if not for the fact that he picked the same day that James Jean to show his stuff around, to show his stuff. Actually, they came together, but yeah. but, but I was a choice of one or the other, and so the embarrassment of riches. Yeah. And yeah. I got, I was lucky enough to have Issa Andrews uh, do covers for House of Mystery. Yeah. And he yeah. did beautiful, beautiful work yes. on that book. And uh, I, I, very recently, I took a, uh, a cover into like a Michaels to get it framed. Uh, I walk in there, and the guy behind the counter goes, oh, that's Esau Andrews, she's one of my favorite artists. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it's from this comic book, House of Mystery, that, that I wrote it, and he was like, oh, okay. But yeah, his art. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, man. Well, that's the thing, because honestly, I keep making this point, and truly taking nothing away from our panel, but a great, great writers, if you don't have a great artist as well, you're kind of like working from a deficit from, from page one because that is what intrigues us. It is the James Jean cover. It is the the Lam Medina and Mark Buckingham art and Tony Akins and others uh, that, that that followed in Brian Bowen doing covers. I mean, that's the thing. That's the calling card. Well, that, and, and but it takes obviously the story foundation. Well, too. yeah, but you can you can make a decision immediately on an artist. You can take a glance and decide whether or not you want to see more. It's hard to take a glance at someone's writing and decide whether or not to do more. So, yeah. so yeah, the artist is is the the uh, the vehicle of uh, choice if you if you want. And it can be tricky too because like there have been times when I've read somebody's work, but got people I like personally, uh, not YouTube. I'm not talking about you, but people like I've read somebody's work for a long time. And they're like, I don't really think this is for me. Like you know, like I, I, I can see that there's quality to it. Yes. I know that it's good. I know that they're decent folks. And after reading like 20 inches or something, I'd be like, I don't think I like this. I don't think that this is something I want to read more. So it can take a while. It can. And it can go the other way. I didn't think I'd bring that zombie because I hate zombie fiction. But you, you did something else with it. And, you, and she wasn't a mindless idiot, which is what I hate most about zombie fiction. I need something. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I would guess, you know, and really, I, I don't want to, as we're early enough in the conversation, please, if you have questions, start lining up now, because I don't want us to run into the problem we had in the last panel and us to go over. So, please, it's an open discussion. We're just going to keep it spoiler free in terms of how a fable's ended, but I'm happy to, you know, get into talk about characters and stuff. The microphone is right there. What so, panel follows this one? Um, well, I think they're doing the art auction and the, and the, the uh, raffle. Yeah, screw them. We'll sell you as long as you want. No, no, no. So, but no, yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, but you know, from from arc one, honestly, I mean, just the idea of turning, you know, just the humanization of these of these animals and characters, and modernization of them, and and just these classic choices to take, you know, the big bad wolf and turn him into this trench coat wearing investigator, constable of of Fable Town and stuff, and then. You know, uh, certainly the initially he and Snow, the, the, the key and the most intriguing characters in that. Um, just you know, humanizing all these people. You know, King Cole, uh, everybody, Prince Charming. I mean, the, the, the list can go on, and your choices for them. 
were just, uh, you know, kind of really amazing and, and, and really surprising given that we, it's at the same time familiar territory because they are the fables we grew up with, but making story choices that none of us were expecting. Clearly that's the trick. And I'm sure it was, and uh, likely, you know, what was the impetus for, I guess, that, that, that thought? I mean, that's really the germ of the, the, the books. It was, a, it was a practical choice. The idea uh, was always that it would be uh, fairy tale characters in modern times. And it would be the same characters you read about in the original stories. So I needed to account for all the time that happened between the original stories and now. Um, if you are not familiar with um, Castle Waiting by Linda Medley, uh, it preceded Fables, um, uh, and it is a wonderful book, which is in the same territory, which is what happens next after Happily Ever After. Happily Ever After. In her case, it's what it was right after, immediately next. Uh, I went a little further than that, and I had to fill in, they could not have just sat dormant for all this time. So it's like, what do I want them to be now? What is the essential value of this character to me? And all this, and how do I get him in that place? Big Bad Wolf was my favorite fable character. Second favorite was the Pied Piper of Hamlin. I guess I liked the bad boys. Um, and I wanted to use that. I specifically liked him as a kid because he was the first character I was aware of to show up in more than one tale. He, you know, had the whole run in with Red Riding Hood and he had the run-in with the pigs. And in my mind, I'm sure in the original tales they were not the same Big Bad Wolf, and in all the Aesop's fables they were different, but in my mind they were all the same. I love comics, crossovers were important, so that's why uh, the Big Bad Wolf was important. Um, I could have kept him as the villain, uh, but then uh, I could only use him one or two times, and then he'd have to go, because I, I hate ineffectual heroes. If Big Bad Wolf is the villain and he's, he's still popping up 10 years into the uh, series and going, boo, it's me again, that is not a story about how villainous the villain is, it's a story about how incompetent the heroes are, that they can't seem to get rid of this guy. Um, I once got to write a Joker story in which he publicly thanked Batman, his partner, uh, because they did have a partnership because Joker go gets out of the asylum, goes crazy, kills some people, and Batman would come along whenever Joker's getting a little overly tired to catch him and put him where he can rest and recoup with the, the next spa day. Yes, <laughs> and it's like this cycle. Uh, the because person who needs to be fired is the head of security at Arkham Asylum. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> the person who needs to be fired is, is you know, if, if Gotham was a Republican-run town, the death penalty would have taken care of all of Batman's problems. <laughs> anyway, but that's uh, here. Anyway, uh, the big bad wolf. That was probably as a job for yeah. you in his administration. He had to be a good guy because I didn't want to write a story about incompetent good guys. Uh, so the the story backstory filling in. How does bad guy become a good guy? Was everything, and you got hints of that with as a series, uh, but. Now, did, did you know from the beginning about his parentage, or was that something that you worked out as you went along to explain that one aspect? I knew, I needed to know why he could huff and puff, because wolves don't do that. Interesting. And so I knew that he was the illegitimate son of the North Wind. I did not know then that there would ever be a story to explain that. It was just going to be a toss-off thing. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, that I did. Him, I put a lot of work in. Some of the ones that really surprised me, like Boy Blue was supposed to be just a background character, Flycatcher was supposed to be just a background character, and Totem Kinder was supposed to be just a witch that was helpful from time to time, but never uh, fully fleshed out. Those are the ones that yeah. that grew in the telling. And maybe too, in the sense of, well, let's explain this and stuff like that. I was never, Fables to work as fables needed to be fairy tale characters, therefore you don't bring on gods, and I knew the North Wind was God like so he would never, never appear. Yeah. But then he did. So. Can I ask you another question? No, I love the fact that you guys are talking amongst yourselves. All right, we're just going to ignore you. Uh, um, so the, those three characters outstripped your initial expectations. Yeah. Um, there was more grist for the mill there than you thought. Yeah. Were there characters that you thought you would be spending more time with, and yeah, but they just sort of with it on the vine. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, can I guess one? Go. 
because you, I like what you guys did with it, but I always felt like Mobley didn't get as much screen time as I think you would have originally expected when you were going to give it away. Mobley, uh, the entire Jungle Book cast was when I was thinking of doing a uh, spinoff. Um, uh, Jack of Fables. Use it. Yeah, Jack of Fables was almost Mobley. Wow. Yeah. As in Mobley and the Jungle Book guys, and he was going to be. You know, our Tarzan. Yeah. 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 Right. That is. And yeah, I never got back to him. Uh, the nice thing is, is those are still public domain characters, and as long as it's not called Fables, yeah, they still on the table. And well, there was that other guy, the the smoking dude, who never actually shows up on panel. Right. Right. Uh, He's just a feather cat or feather top. Feather top. And I, I, I think I support you had it. I remember on a panel <laughs> once, I made a joke. I cracked a joke about it. And I think I completely. Deflated whatever plans you had for it. You probably you ruined so much because <laughs> he shows up in the pro story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was to bring him on stage. So basically, there, there are a couple of field. There's like three field agents out there, Mobley being one of them. They kind of roam around and do stuff. And well, I can't remember the dude's name. What is his? Uh, at the top. Yeah, yeah. Mobley and uh, I think Hot Frog from the. Is it Amber Pierce? Uh, yeah, they, with, uh, but but yeah. but fat top's what I'm thinking of. Basically, in order to su survive, he has to smoke a pipe constantly. Right, right. <laughs> and so I made this joke. You know, I asked what it was going on with that guy. Um, and then on a panel in San Diego, I made a joke. Was like, well, he's just stuck somewhere in Eastern Europe because he can't get on a plane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. And that did it. I, from time to time, I would take time off and start working out how he gets back. Yeah. And a lot of that, when I did the Mowgli story about how he hunted Bigby, yeah. I used some of the, the, the travel routes yeah. that I was going to use for Feathertop and never got around to it. Because he can't get anywhere anymore. He, he, he can't get back to the States because the whole no smoking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. All right, let's get to some uh, audience questions, please. Um, I'm not enough. Not a project, sir, because it's for the podcast, by all means. Uh, yeah, talk up. Long, long story short, I was down talking to the guys to sign my, my book case. I uh, thank you again. The stupid question is, is that what exactly, as far as the writing, as far as the drawing and so forth, what, my two parts, one, which was your favorite, and what was the one that you loathed or you had the hardest problem time dealing with? In, in fables? In fables. Or Jack. Well, I was going to say, all three of you can answer this question. Yeah. Right yeah. yeah. Fables yeah. material, this absolutely. The whole panel sure it's, it's just me. My, my favorite changes a lot. Um, I have a fondness for what... All right. To say that, i got to say this. It sort of became clear when, when Mark Buckingham was taking over the series is that he, he wasn't going to get to do every one because he needed breaks and uh, he could not do a book every month. So we worked in shorter stories with other artists. Um, people got to call it, including their editors, called them fill-in stories. And they were never fill-in stories in the sense of, yes, they were different artists, but, but I tried to make every story important. My favorite, in the sense of it turning out more or less line for line like I envisioned, and the worst thing to do to ruin a story is to start writing it. You know, you, you ruin things by beginning because in your mind they're perfect. But the Rodney and June thing, the, the two wooden soldiers that wanted to become real, uh, the kind of Pinocchio thing. Uh, uh, Jim Fern drew that, right? And Jim Fern drew that. That's beautiful. It came out almost exactly like I envisioned. So that's that's fair to me. Loathe. Let's let's take other things because I'm gonna have to think about the the load part. I don't want to indict anyone. And again, but it's one of those things to where, let's face it, we all in our professions, you love doing this or that, and then there. Uh, really, yeah. I got to Well, the, I forward. think both, my answer to both is the same thing, and it's something nobody ever saw outside the offices. Because Jim Jim Fern drew because so they because Bill is Bill. Bill, you have certain. I won't say this the wrong way. Um, there were fears at certain times that you wouldn't necessarily be as productive as you should be. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, so uh, they would every once in a while like commission like, like, fill, like, inventory, fill, like inventory, inventory stories. And they use, like, Shelly would use them as tryouts for those of us who would be doing other things. 
Yeah, my um, first uh, my first ever paid comics work is a Fables inventory script that was drawn by Tony Eakins. Yeah, no kidding. And it's sitting in a drawer somewhere in DC. So I think so. My first one was the Jack and Fables fill I did with Tony. Yeah. And uh, but the second thing I did uh, was a Fables inventory story that Jim Fern drew, um, which is has now been mooted because I don't think the setting even exists anymore. But it was it was the movie Chinatown, but set in Little Town, the little, the little <laughs> small town, small town, <laughs> which is the, the little where all the little people are under the tree in the, the farm, and uh, it was this gritty crime drama about like a, like the, like drug like people yeah. people like sneaking pixie dust out of Neverland and kids were getting all messed up and floating at the ceiling. And um, there was also a bunch of like racial tension with the gnomes, who I was basically playing with the Smurfs, because all they, they only said gnome, that was the only word in their language. Uh, but there was like the one affirmative action hire on the police force, it was a gnome. Wait, remind you, was that before the group who could only say good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you, all right. And uh, I actually had so much fun with it. Like it was just this one twin, ridiculous, way two page murder mystery set in this ridiculous setting. It was a lovely story. It was drawn so well. Yeah, and yeah. like the, like the, the tearaway kids are like go out and get messed up on pixie dust and like drive around in Barbie's car and crash and stuff. <laughs> no one ever saw it. Could you guys like make those stories like you would? You know, I'm sure there's yeah. going to be an ultimate omnibus or something. Could we possibly see these stories? It's I'm cool. I'm sure. That it's, you know. The thing is, those things that are put in drawers are literally put away in drawers. That, that lost I'm sure that they if we the reminded them. They were like they, these were not they weren't inked or lettered. So they were yeah. like they were okay. fully penciled. They, they could they were they were books that could be made ready to go in like a week mm -hmm. if if Bill just disappeared on a uh, Hogan's Heroes marathon or something. Like <laughs> <laughs> no, but I get that, but yeah, in, in terms of you know, because guys yeah. always those two tomorrows are the like I think right now, certain people that will not be named again uh, are, are desperate for any fable stuff. So maybe, maybe now is the time of okay, like a uh, rarities and B sides collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that against your wishes, though? Bill? No. Oh, okay. No, no, no. I'd love to see that. But see, I I don't think you have to have that that adherence to continuity that uh, that some do. Like, you know, well, these always could have happened. I mean, yeah. not, they, they were right, written right. to take place during sure. things out the elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's that's very good. And, and Matthew, your your uh, favorite? Uh, my favorite. Uh, what is it? My favorite what? Uh, uh, yeah, we'll favorite thing about doing favorite favorite thing, thing. thing oh, that oh. you did, whether no. it was a panel, whether it was a story, whether it was. It was a, doing. Oh, that's easy. It was doing Babe the Blue Ox. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah Babe the Blue Ox pages were the the most fun. Um, that I ever had, I've ever had writing comics, and it was like you just get to write this like structured gag, and because of the way that it was set up, it was always funny. You know, like it, it was like it was just comedy gold, and the whole thing took like twenty minutes to do, and then you got your whole page rate for it. And it was like it's like you're getting away with murder, and it was so much fun. And we did it every month, and um, we did, and and. Before that, I could not understand how these gag -a day cartoonists could come up with so much material. Uh, but with Babe, it just it clicked. It was, it, I was certain the first one we wrote that we would never think of a second thing. And, and that, yeah. So. Okay. There, was, there was a two-part Flycatcher baseball story that I don't loathe it, but that came about as far out from what I imagined in my head when I set out to write it, so so maybe something like that. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, gentlemen. Get a get a chip for your uh, trouble, sir. You can, can we get a check in for the uh, raffle. Awesome. So I, I would say probably the the least favorite thing for anyone is, is writing panel descriptions, right? Oh, hey, okay. okay. really? You like writing panel descriptions? Yeah. Hate writing free descriptions. Sorry. Okay. Interesting. Sir? Now, at the beginning you stated you wanted to kind of keep it spoiled and free, but yeah. uh, when I was at the table earlier, I, I had a... I told you, you go ahead and ask him. Yeah, decide whether or not to answer. It's the panel's call, so feel free. Okay. Issue 150, Rose Red spoke with someone who changed her mind. Now, this is so Shatner esque at the time right now. I feel really, really weird about it. But what was, was she company? speaking with? So, who was not yet read 150? 
who does of those who does not want want them to be spoiled in any way? <laughs> Are you, see, I, I told you. Go ahead, put your hand in your ears and go. Your muffs. <laughs> There's a scene where you want to know who it was she was speaking to, and was it who you think it was? Yes. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you. I had a second part because I figured that could be this Okay. Uh, as far as the success of the digital comic, uh, The Wolf Among Us, do you see that? Isn't I mean, that lovely? In 38, I mean, I bought the game, so I got yeah. fantastic, but. But it adds so game. much to the game. I know, go ahead. But do you great. see any other story arcs you could. Uh, adapt into that weekly digital format. Here, here's the thing. I'm retired from fables. This is the only guy on the panel who's still doing fables. So ask him. I don't know. So I win. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think you should take this yeah, serious. Okay, I will. I will. Because here's the thing. I, I don't know if, if, how many of you have sampled the Wolf Among Us uh, comic. Because I think for some people I, that I've talked to at, at panels and stuff, it was kind of like a tough sell. And I think it was because it's like a, a comic book based on a video game, based on a comic book, you know, based on fairy tales, based on things that happened to Neil, Neil Gaiman's head. Yeah, you know, like this is the origin <laughs> of these ideas. Um, but we uh, and and my writing partner Dave Justice and I. I uh, spent a, long, a lot of time and effort uh, making the comic, and it's beautifully drawn by the artists who, who they've got working on it. Um, and we've added a lot to the story, which was already a very good story, uh, which I was surprised to see when I played the game. I didn't realize that games like this really existed. I don't know much about video games. So when I played the game, I was like, oh, this is actually a really good, really compelling story. And I think Bill had, you had something to do with its genesis, right? <laughs> No, I was uh, hired. Uh, well, for one thing, DC made the deal with Telltale Games without my knowledge or cooperation. They happened to remember to mention, oh, by the way, we're doing a video game. Um, so my agent went separately to Telltale Games, and we made a deal where I worked as a traffic cop, which was my job was to make sure they didn't go off the rails. Um, I That's think what traffic cops do. Yeah. That's more like the, the guys who said a train. Yeah, fine, 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 fine. Look, I'm retired. I don't have to worry about nice metaphors. Um, I think I told them at one point, reminded them that Bigby couldn't go to the farm. And I think I reminded them once that Bigby couldn't drive. I may have... A lot of taxi rides in that case. Yeah, I may have mentioned that he uh, can't be in a shootout. Well, he can be in a shootout. He can't participate by shooting because yeah, he, he's, he's never used a gun. He stated so. It was that kind of thing. It was keep them on track. The problem is, is they knew the material frontwards and backwards, and they needed very, very little help keeping them on track. I got paid for it, and I felt, you know, you talk about feeling guilty getting paid for the babe pages. I, I mean, I cashed the check, but <laughs> I did very little for it other than say, "Wow, guys, this is terrific." But yeah. I, I will say, to continue answering your question, that there's a lot of um, additional material that we've added to the story of Wolf Among Us, uh, especially around the character Bloody Mary and the Crooked I mean, Man. I think what he was asking is like, so once you finish the- I know what he's asking, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let me finish. Relax. We have all the time in the world. Right? We have all the time in the world. Uh, you've got 14 minutes. Sure. Yes. So we, we've added a bunch of this thing. And we also have done things where we have seeded ideas that if there were ever the opportunity to do more stories in this format or other formats, that we would have planted those seeds. So I think that there's, I don't think anyone is saying that there couldn't ever be more stories like that, but it, it would kind of be, you know, it would have to be something that was okayed by Bill, you know, beforehand and and that he was real happy with the idea and all that stuff. I think Shelley and or Rowena, maybe one, maybe the other, uh, thinks I'm I'm disengaged from uh, Matt and Dave's work on The Wolf Among Us because I have never once uh, put in the correction. Uh, for one thing, I think, I think they think that I should be the guiding and, and give you a lot of editorial direction, which I think is ridiculous. Uh, you give someone a, a story and let them do what they can do with it. Uh, but the other thing is, is uh, 
uh, they're adhering wonderfully to the story in the game, and all the other stuff you're adding is just so terrific that even when I could say, well, you know, this could be a little continuity problem, it's like, now I just love it. And then the, the other input is to, you know, they, they first tried to run by, you know, corrections by me, mm -hmm. so that we could each do a round of corrections. Like, you guys can catch those. You, they don't need three people telling them that there's a typo on, um, you know, page or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, I get each issue. I read it, it's, it's terrific. Um, uh, my, my suggestion is if you have other ideas to keep going, if you want to, mm -hmm. you'll run it by Rowena and, and Shelly at some point, they'll ask me if it's okay, and, and it's like, well, yes, Matt and Dave, of course, it's okay. Yeah. I will pre-approve. Well, there you have it. It's been recorded, right? Yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> that's legally binding. Exactly. Yeah. Posted by yeah. you. Here, take it. Make sure you get a pirate coin, my man. Absolutely. Uh, my first Thanks. question is, for you, that all that series, uh, do you guys have any information on season two of The Wolf Among Us? Actually, I do. Yeah. Um, I do. I spent some time talking to Adam Harrington, who is the voice of Big B from... Uh, from the game, and I said, hey, do you have any information on season two of Wolf Among Us? And he said, they won't tell me anything. <laughs> so that is what I know <laughs> definitively <laughs> about season two of Wolf Among Us. Uh, my second more serious question is, with the Wolf Among Us, there are Bloody Mary characters, um, Tiny Tim, Jersey Devil, these less fable-ish characters. Were there characters that you guys kind of wanted to use from lore, or maybe more recent stories, or anything like that, that thought, well, maybe this won't quite fit with Fables, but then they kind of took big liberties with Wolf Among Us, and you guys kind of want to do something like that? Well, no, there was the opposite of that. Uh, I should have thought of the Crooked Man, and I will kick myself forever that I did. Of course, of course there should have been. Bluebeard was like the villain, but he was the penthouse villain. Every penthouse villain, you need a on-the-streets yeah. villain, too. Should have thought of that. I mean, I, I loved the, the series. As a matter of fact, a, a novel I plan to write just takes the, the, the Crooked Man, was it a nursery rhyme? Right? Right. Yeah. 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 Rhyme and replaces Crooked with Haunted because I wanted to do a haunted house. Story. So there was a haunted man living so in the, the haunted house. sixpence? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I had to <laughs> write that someday. That's as much as I, I should have made that <laughs> great idea. I had the fudge a bit. I mean, because you, you, you'd set the press a bit. With some of the, the some of the characters that were at the farm, um, are more like nursery run characters than they are like fables. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, yeah. But uh, you know what? You know you guys know what the rule is, right? It has to be in public domain, and, and Bill has to want to do it. That's yeah, the, the, what. That. That was the Those two, two rules. requirements for being a second one's harder than the first, maybe. What? The second one's harder than the first. No. Well, uh, sometimes. sometimes internet search. I tried to stay problem. away from mythology. Didn't always succeed, but yeah. Did how much of the tall tales of you know like. Some of the tall tale characters, did you use everybody that you wanted to in terms of those? They, would they qualify because they're public or are they public? Sure. Um, we, we finally got to a lot of them in, in the Americana run, the Jack. Yeah. Uh, some of them didn't quite fit in just the tone of it because these were supposed to be medieval characters that came to America. Therefore, people that were already in America didn't quite fit. But some of them, like Jack, because Jack as a tall tale character, traveled to America with the people, and there are the American Jack tales where he continues to be the trickster and stuff. So we were able to incorporate some of that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, mostly we stayed away from them until, uh, because of they didn't really fit in with the medieval thing until right. we did a thing where I'm certain uh, Matt came up with most of the uh, concept behind Americana, where now they did fit. So. Um, and all they needed to do to fit in with what had been done with Fables is that the Fable Town didn't know that these other communities existed. So, yeah. They fit when they needed to. I understand. Very cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Did you get a chip, sir? Oh, get a chip. If you want. You can take two because you answered the blaster question. Oh, uh, there you yeah. go. This is something you probably got tired of talking about a long time ago, and I never realized regards to the ones that put a time on TV that you said in the past that that very likely could have been, you know, not necessarily copied or anything like that. My question is more now, and there may be something worse I'm not aware of, is there a chance still of a 
Fables TV show in the future. We just because I think Once Upon a Time will be very, very different. Other than concept, is very, very different than what you did. Is there a chance of maybe after no time goes by, TV show in the future? I think there's always a chance. Uh, the last they were trying to make it a feature film. Uh, you understand that the entire television and film industry seems to be dedicated to finding ways to say no to projects. Um, do you ever hear the, uh, the story that, that is true that like when, when a male lion or male lions come in and take over a product by killing their rivals, the first thing they do is kill all the cubs so that the females will go into heat and, and they'll be able to, you know, fill the pride with their cubs. Well, that's very much Hollywood in a nutshell. For example, um, uh, at Studio A, there was a champion for Fables, a series. Uh, he's great, we're gonna go, it's greenlit. It's gonna happen, but then that guy leaves for a better job over in Studio B. Meantime, the guy that gets uh, his job at Studio A immediately cancels every project because if they go, that guy from from before might get all the credit. Uh, so you don't want that, you want your own kids. So uh, in that method, Fables as a project, uh, I mean, everyone sort of vaguely knows some of the places it's been at. It's gotten killed so many times. Um, and uh, DC has turned down, one of the guys in charge of shopping Fables as an idea, turned down a lot of stuff because he had a very particular idea of what it should be. Yeah. It may happen, it may not. I would have to think Hollywood seems to always be running out of ideas too, so I'd have to think they'd want to come back and the critical claim for it, but maybe, maybe not hopefully. It has yeah. to, to be a TV show rather than a movie. Don't kind of apply thing. logic <laughs> to it. It doesn't work. I'd rather yeah. be a TV show than a movie, right? Because well, I mean, yeah, but don't yeah. apply logic. Right. All right. And, I've been, and I know Bendis like, went through a million directors and, and a couple studios with powers before it finally found its place in Sony to the point of the last FX pilot that got made but didn't air, I heard a couple of the writers say, God, they have put so much, FX put so much money in powers, they'd be losing money if they committed to a series at this point. And it, because it was there for 10 years. So yeah, it's it's weird that way. But then again, I, when, every, when all thought was, all right, it's not gonna happen, boom, and that winds up its own. <coughs> So, sir, would you mind if the person behind you just gets an opportunity to ask a question before you ask another? If, if you don't mind, just, just don't want everyone to get a chance to ask a question that wants to first. I just wanted to ask, uh, through the entire series, without ruining anything, who is the hardest character to kill? To kill? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Without ruining anything? Because I don't know how much you... Um, yeah, keep it. Yeah. But no, I, I meant without ruining like yeah. 150. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know how deeply people have read into the series. Um, 2010. <laughs> Let's give a five year bet. I'm teasing. We did a Cubs in Toyland thing. Anyone here has not read yet the Cubs in Toyland book? Okay. Right. <laughs> that required one of the kids getting sacrificing himself. Right up until the actual panel in which you did it, uh, Bucky and I were burning up the phone lines, deciding whether or not we dare do this. Uh, dare did it if it's possible. Uh, sure. Um, that was rough. Yeah, it was. Oh, absolutely. It, it was rough. Um, and then everybody eats it from that point. Yeah. <laughs> by, by comparison, when Matt and I were doing Jack, if one of us got to the point where we asked the other, do we dare do this? That was the answer had automatically yes. Yeah. automatic yes. That flipped the yes switch. Which is how you ended which is how you got the ending of that series. Are we going too far? If it's yes, we did it. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, and could could one get the other laughing maniacally over the phone? Then that joke the gets magic. put in because, you know, maybe it will work with the reader. Um, so Jack was a was a yes machine. It was really just like how over the top far can we go? I mean, he slept with his sisters, and and didn't really much regret it. It was just a terrible, you know. He's a terrible person. Um, with fables, it was yeah. Uh, that's the closest. But I feel like too in, in Jack of Fables, it's it's this sort of catharsis you get of like fables is this 
you know, it's this beautiful work of art, and you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to go like Godzilla, like smashing through it and breaking stuff. But there's something really fun about smashing through and breaking stuff, and I feel like Jack was the place where you could do that, where it's sort of like anything went, you know, um, it was always anything can happen day. And then if we want to say, um, yeah, let's just kill everybody, you know, we can do that. But he, he did want the Shakespeare ending. Yeah. Can we end Jack? And I go, yeah, sure. Can we kill everyone? And I was like, well, dare we do this? And I'm like, okay, now we have to pause it. But I, I we sort of we didn't kill a baby. Yeah, we didn't kill a baby. Are you sure? Oh, that's right. The we baby. Like the old man. The old man, but he wasn't. Well, yeah, I guess he was a Jack Fables character. Yeah. He was another one that I didn't want to kill him because I was going to use him again, and I never got around to it. Oh, old Sam. Um, old Sam. Yeah. Uh, I wrote us into a corner that we couldn't get out of because of who Jack was, which I wanted to do the uh, the Fafner myth where someone's greed and, and, and uh, uh, just terrible, terrible ways cause him to turn into a dragon. This is the, the ring of niggling stuff. Uh, so we had Jack do that. But then the only way to get out of it, to, to reverse it, is for him to become a good person. And poor, poor Matt and I was like, well, that wasn't gonna happen. There's, there's just no way. Because one of our rules was no, uh, it was the Seinfeld rule, no hugging and no learning. Jack could never <laughs> learn from his mistakes. Therefore, we were stuck until, and the only way to get out of you know, the ghost Jack came back as a person after the dragon died. But uh, um, yeah, we, uh, we, we, we wrote ourselves into a corner so many times. But usually we can write ourselves into a corner and get out of it, except for that was one of the sacrosanct rules that we could never break. He was, and he didn't we even write that as a line. Well, then I'm stuck in the dragon forever. So I've got to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because. He knew it himself. He, yeah. <laughs> and I want, I'm glad we got into Jack territory because, as you just said, I appreciated those kind of non expected fable stories coming from Jack. And the same goes with Cinderella, too. I mean, uh, you know, you know, just the, the, the path of Cinderella as this spy was just a blast. By the way, there, there's some generosity that's coming over here. The reason Chris started doing the Cinderella things is he came up to me. And was it one of those San Diego after party things with the idea for Cinderella? What did you? No, that's not no. what happened. Oh, that was uh, Mark, uh, uh, Mark and Draco became up in the. Well, so, uh, it was right after the first time we saw Cinderella as a super spy. Um, and right. we issued that, what, 18 or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, early on. Yeah. And, uh, Serge and I were having lunch. Uh, she pulled that off. So, and I was like, man, that, that's such a great idea. Like they should, he should do like miniseries, and, and they should let me write. But I wasn't doing comics at the time at all. Uh, I was writing novels, and it was like I think like a year and a half later or something. He just called me up and said that I want to do it. So I don't think really. At some point, you told me this the idea though. Well, you called me up and asked me if I wanted to, do it, and I, I spun the idea on the phone. No, because I, I think you're, you at some point came up to me and said, "This is a great idea. This is what you should do." This, this, and this. Oh no! The, it, so you may be thinking of the sex so of the second mini. Oh, okay. So the second mini series. Um, I'll spoil it. Okay. This uh, is like a, a much more boring sequel to Rashomon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, so my wife and I are watching The Wiz, right? Because it's awesome. And um, Man, as I'm watching it, I'm like, uh, in both this version of the story and in the original and in the novel. Uh, Dorothy gets transported to this magical world and then just goes around killing people uh, for gain. Like she yes. kills, she kills one witch by accident, gets some good stuff out of it, and this seems like a pretty good gig. And so then yes. it's hired to kill another one. It's really weird in the movie too because the mother's like, "You're gonna have to come kill the wicked witch." The West. She's like, "Okay." Yeah. yeah. There's, there's never any moral qualms. No. I, She's like, "All right." I love that description of the Wizard of Oz, uh, the TV Guide description, which is. A uh, young girl yes. the line, kills the first person she meets and teams up with three others to kill again. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, 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 that's and it is. It's so that person that her yes. sister and kill her. <laughs> You're right. You're her right. grieved sister yes. who only wants her dead sister shooting. Yes. <laughs> so I, I, I emailed Bill. I was like, wait, you need a whole new life. Right. <laughs> How like, dude, like, have you ever, like, uh, need an antagonist? Because I'd already done the one Cinderella series, and I just assumed that I'd never do it more. 
because um, I burn bridges and stuff. Um, and then I was like, if you ever do any more Cindy stuff, like you should bring Dorothy on as like her, her nemesis because she's she's an assassin. <laughs> she she she's a witch killer for hire. Yes, she's she read great. She would have read uh, uh, Robert uh, Shaw's uh, character in Russia with Love, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on. Like I think I thought like she would have gotten a taste for it. You know, like, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty good at this, you know. And uh, we just go around killing people for magical stuff. And uh, oh, that's awesome. th- and that's when you were like, we well, should do that. And I'm yeah. Like, oh, all right, I'll do that. Well, I guess like what I meant by the generosity is that, that you called up and, and just threw this like wonderful idea to me. Like, it's, you know, expecting nothing in return. Well, so, yeah, but, but yeah, well, you should. Is, I, I'd forgotten at that point uh, the bit of business uh, where she was in Jack of Fables. Because mm-hmm. um, it, it just been a while since I read that. So I was like, oh, crap. Like she was, But that, that gave a great story possibility for, like, well, why has she been off the board for this? Right. Um, so she's been off in this other book. And, and the memory hole was a wonderful device for keeping people off yeah. stage until we need them to. Yeah. 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 That's fun. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sir. So, anyway. I'm back. Last part of uh, reading, and this is again for all the gentlemen, reading the stories. I know there's collaboration, I get it, I understand. But reading the book, reading the stories, exactly did they jump off at you to, as you were saying, with Cindy, Dorothy, Wizard of Oz? Wow, did that just, you were watching with you? How, there's some of the tales, I forget the, the Chicken Hut, uh, it's a Baba Yaga. Russian football, I had never heard it. I'm pretty literate, and it, wow, wait a second, I gotta go check this out, whether it be Rimer, internet, whatever. Was it hard, you know, again, going back to the writing, were they extremely easy? Were they really easy ones? So, oh, A, B, to C, to D, and then, wait, to get from N to X, you know, what what particular storylines? Well, well, in this case, like, the cart came before the horse. Of course, I was reading fairy tales um, my entire life, and uh, uh, so I was kind of steeped in it. Um, I was by no means an expert, although I've been accused of being one uh, since Fables have started, which is kind of cool. I mean, scholars saying, oh, this guy is a, a scholar of fairy tales. I'm like, no, I'm a guy that I, I read uh, for pleasure. Uh, the nice thing that happened with Fables is then I had a justification. I could, I could, uh, uh, quite often I would read when I should have been getting work done, and, and at least with Fables doing fairy tale reading, uh, I could, it, with justification, say, no, I'm, this is part of the work. This is, uh, and like but, the Jack, uh, Jack of Tales, where he went to the Americana, it's like, yeah. oh, I remember, grew up in Disney, wonderful world, and so forth, and then, oh, wait, I didn't get that. Was yeah, but I never did it research. Okay. What I did was, you read the stories, during fables I'm making mental notes that, yeah, this might be something I can use someday. Sometimes I would make physical notes, but that's... And a lot of it is just recontextualizing, too, because, yeah. like, just to talk about the, the Dorothy stuff, like, I went back, and so I had the original idea, and then I went back and read Wizard of Oz, and, like, the stuff that those shoes, the silver slippers are designed, des- described as being able to do, I was like, she never does anything cool with those shoes in the books. No, she's not a, she loses them right away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so maybe she remembers where she dropped them, she could be cooler. <laughs> but asking the question constantly, what could you do with this? Uh, or what could you do to subvert it helps. Part of it is it's a sickness. Like, so I can't encounter anything without thinking, like, I'm going to use this in a story. Sure. But Even if it's something horrible. Like some horrible thing that's happened in the world. Like, okay. And then you also play the game too, especially I, I, I do a lot of older things. And, and for instance, Dave and I did this with, uh, with the Beowulf story because there was some things thing and uh, something that didn't add up. And I don't even know if we ever actually used this. Yeah, no, we did. It was it was told in the backstory that um, that uh, Grendel is you know killed in the original story. And so we needed to have some, you know, we wanted to put in some hand wave as to why he was still alive. And so uh, what we decided was that he was uh, ultimately just a, a coward um, who couldn't face his rival face to face. So what he did was he just sort of uh, went off stage and hid for a long time, let his mom try to do his dirty work for him. 
um, and then paid to have Beowulf assassinated later. Because it's a really weird ending to the Beowulf story. Yes. That, uh, and that Beowulf is successful and he and the Geats hang out and do great stuff, and then he's just killed. Just, he's just murdered. Well, sort of. I mean, it implies that after the Grendel thing, he had many, many, many adventures until he's an old king. Right. And the dragon comes and kills him. Uh, that there was lots of stuff. And before Grendel, uh, there was lots of stuff. I mean, he, he swam for uh, seven days and seven nights in full armor, killing many, many sea monsters uh, on the way to win a contest with, with another geat that was pretty good at that, too. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. But you know, his thing was his kung fu grip. Did you notice that? <laughs> that's, like, really, that's his big thing. He would like, grab you with his really strong grip. Um, but the, I, the point is, to, to answer the question, that um, I think that, that we have a tendency to kind of look at these stories and say, what else is in this story? You know, what else, what's, what can we pull from this? Uh, to or, make our own? why is this in this story? And you have to answer that question. Like, why can the wolf huff and puff? Why can... Right, why is yeah. it like this? And, what, and then it just seems yeah. to start making up the stories in your head from there. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, John. Last question. Is it? Well, we'll think the, the thing's coming up in about 20 minutes. We're, we're technically over time now, but, but we still got, we have like actually about 25 minutes. So if someone else does have a question, get up now, otherwise this will be the final question. Ah, uh, uh, there he goes. Can, yeah. yeah, can you talk about uh, how the crossover with Unwritten came about? Because um, it sort of happens like right at the end of the second act of Unwritten, and it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, um, Peter Gross uh, is a uh, Minneapolis native. Uh, well, not, I, I don't know if he was born there, but he was living there. And I'm in that area now, and so we ended up seeing each other a lot. I've known Peter forever, um, uh, and I've always liked his stuff, and, and I congratulated them on the unwritten. Uh, before Fables, I, uh, I proposed two different series to Vertigo that was very much uh, like the unwritten. It was, the premise is, uh, you can you have characters that can travel inside the books and have adventures there and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, Vertigo turned both of them down, uh, wisely so because. Uh, and even though I was a little peaked when The Unwritten was announced and was like, oh, well, that was very much my idea, but they found the right avenue into that idea. Um, so we're talking about that, and at a convention. Uh, we're sitting side by side, and, and one or the other was speculated. You know, Fables of the Unwritten could almost coexist in the same extended fictional universe. And like, well, not just almost. I mean, it could. I mean, when there's many, many lands that you can go to. Uh, and it started like that. The weird thing is, is... Um, uh, so Peter and I had the idea and, and bounced it off of uh, our writer and artist, respectively. And those two Brits got together and really worked out the meat of the story. Um, so, yeah, it, it happened in two different stages, but it, it just seemed inevitable to happen. And we got to have our cake and eat it, too, because we got to show, if we, if we went left rather than right at a certain key point, uh, what would have happened, and we got to explore that, and that was kind of neat. It, it, it's interesting because it's almost at that point they become, they go into their own, into a vertigo, right? Into, like, to, the unwritten characters are inside the fables book. Yeah. Rep chip, sir. Oh, or yeah. absolutely. If you're not required, get that rep. Hey, you're not required, but if you're in the rep, you might get some fun stuff. Uh, is there a character or story that you wish you could have another crack at, like that you, you feel like you didn't quite nail and you would, you know, and if so, what would you want to redo with that? Almost, um, Peter Pan was originally gonna be the adversary. Uh, I'm glad it worked out that we couldn't use him uh, because I think Geppetto and the spoiling thing became a much better, I mean, secret puppet master behind the scenes, you couldn't do better than that. Absolutely. Uh, when Peter Pan finally did become available, uh, the bloom was kind of off that rose. Uh, 
you gotta understand, I, I always knew Peter Pan was a villain from childhood because the whole movie, I, I, I like many, first encountered him in the uh, Disney movie. The very first scene, he shows up and steals kids away from a family that loves them. I mean, he was clearly the villain of the piece. Um, that's why Doc, uh, Dr. Hook, Captain Hook, which may be Dr. Hook. Now, there's a crossover. Um, <laughs> Better look next time. Uh, he was clearly maligned as the bad guy when he was clearly the good guy. And so in the original fables, Peter Pan was going to be the adversary, and Captain Hook, who ended up being Bluebeard, uh, the visual description, the visual design for Captain Hook was going to be uh, the Bluebeard character. Um, which is why in the opening scene, Lan Medina puts uh, a hook under glass with just a little, a little wink to where this is the character he okay. should have been. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, he was going to be the good guy. That he and his his crew are going to Neverland from time to time to rescue these kids and bring them back to to whatever. But uh, uh, that would have been nice to use. Uh, I wanted to use some of the Edgar Rice Burroughs characters, which were becoming public domain. The problem is, is Burroughs was prolific over too long a time, so not all like all of the Tarzan books, for example, are yet in the public domain. Some are, some aren't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I don't think they would have been appropriate. That's why Mobley was going to be my Tarzan character, yeah. you know, Tarzan light, uh, even though he was first. But anyway, uh, but then I get to scratch that itch because now Dynamite has the Burrow stuff and I get to include them in the legendary thing coming up. Uh, so I get, to, yeah, so the, the stuff I really want to use has come around, I think. I was going to do a thing because I can't seem to avoid. Uh, weird interspecies bestiality thing in your stories. Um, I was going to do um, uh, a, a spy adventure story in Asia with the Asian fables who we hadn't seen a lot of. Uh, and review the, the their kind of field agent spy dude is Monkey from Journey to the West. Um, and uh, he can do all kinds of cool shape changing stuff and whatnot. But he's a monkey. Uh, and reveal that that he and Cinderella had, had like a torrid look there in the last couple of years. <laughs> because they were like on the opposite side, they weren't really enemies, and they'd kind of meet in like clandestine related places. And so I think there's a gag. I set it up um, in the second Cinderella thing where she says, maybe I just have a thing for guys with big ears and make me laugh or something, I think maybe. Yeah. And that's a reference to Monkey. Um, so yeah, I wasn't going to actually have on panel her having sex with but like, it would be clear that that's better. I always felt that Finn would be disappointed if like, he would be so hurt. Yeah, yeah. There's some I say, well, I spoke about Linda Medley at the Cathay Wedding, which you should, you should get. Uh, she is one of my favorite obscure fable characters. Uh, Iron John or Iron Heinrich or various versions. Uh, the guy that uh, his in various versions, his kids die in a horrible way. And in order to stave off his grief, he he's an ironsmith, so he, he forms three, he puts three bands of iron around his heart so they can never feel anything again. And he feels no grief. Um, but she, he was part of the cast of uh, Castle Waiting, one of the central cast, the core cast. Uh, so I always stay away from it because it's sort of like, yes, he's public domain and I could have used him, but she kind of laid claim to him. Uh, fair and square before I got there. Uh, I would love that. I mean, the, the tragedy of that character just writes itself. It could have been been great. The the perfect unfeeling person and what happens when those bands you know, come off. So, very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I, I can't even keep going. I, I've never wanted to, to uh, yeah, take your coin. There's, I think we keep going until the coin back. Uh, oh, that's hilarious. No, 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 no but no, I, if you, all right, real fast, sir. Because I was going to say, because I was going to let this be a final thought. If I got to pee then, really bad. Yeah, I was going to say, it's really bad. So we all okay. roll that up. I'm trying to make it like that. I like asking creative people uh, kind of what makes them tick. So outside of your own books or even fables, what? And what do you Nothing but a fed box. It's, it's like read or watch or what you, you know. What, I guess we're in a comic book environment. You read comics, and not necessarily it's a way uh, Astro Boy, uh, Astro Boy, Astro City, Hellboy. Um, oh, I like Astro Boy. Astro Boy. I had, I, 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 come on. 
get bored. Have you read Pluto though? No. Oh, dude, we need to talk about Pluto. Oh, that, that's the, 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 the thing. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm okay. Uh, is Pluto Boy, the Pluto very Astro Boy like? That's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Pluto is, it's an homage yeah. to Astro Boy. I have no idea. No, I do have to read Pluto. All right, okay. that's good to know. Thank you. All right. Also, Gravity Falls and Steven Universe. Um, <laughs> um, I, I am a very voracious, very um, eclectic reader. Um, and I, I, it's kind of on purpose, but also just I, have, I get all kinds of interests and when I get an interest, I'll follow that interest down a rabbit hole, and I'll read and learn everything I can about that thing, and then my, you know, until my fiance says, can we stop hearing about the Sumerians for a while? And then I know that it's like, kind of run its course, and then I will go and do another. You're like shaking your head and laughing, like, is this you or is this him? It's you, you're that guy, okay. I'm sorry, that's just how he is. It's not, it's not gonna change. Yeah, following things down the rabbit hole methodology is, Pretty much what works. I went down a really deep Sumerian hole just a couple weeks ago. No, really? Yeah, they're fascinating. Yeah, it's very helpful. And sometimes it leads to wonderful places. I mean, I followed one thing after another after another. I cannot even remember what I was initially interested in. But it led to the fact that, you know, during the, the Second World War, uh, the Allies built a ship out of ice and uh, a battleship. I did with some sawdust in there, too. Well, the, the, yeah, they put stuff on top of it as insulation, but. Uh, and it took a one horsepower motor to keep the ice. You know, I just found out, I'm, I'm running stories out of this, um, that uh, in the 1940s, they identified three different giant icebergs floating around the Arctic, okay? And then, so starting in 1948, they started putting stations on them. Yeah. And they were, they, were, they were manned up until the 70s, um, just floating on these icebergs. That's pretty cool. Because I was like, I'm doing a thing, and I need to have like some sort of like Arctic location. I'm putting the ship in. Uh, one of the new novels. It's a sequel to uh, another novel I haven't seen yet. Uh, but uh, just like I wrote where Bigby served in the Second World War, there's this immortal character that one of his flashbacks is he served aboard the ship of ice because, of course, the folk from Ferry don't do well with a lot of iron mm -hmm. around, but they wanted to serve. So they built the ship of ice yeah. for all of the fairy should use the fairy people living in, in the uh, living in our world, the bright world, um, to to do their part. And then they get clobbered because uh, it was a great idea, but it was also uh, so slow that it was a magnet for every ship. But you know that so putting a magnet for every bad guy out there is technically kind of an interesting thing to play with. Anyway, so yes, you follow things on rentals. World War II was also the source of uh, Nutella. That in Italy, uh, yeah, in Italy there was a scarcity of chocolate. It's true. There was a scarcity of chocolate in Italy, like there was in a lot of places, because all the chocolate went to the soldiers. Uh, there was a glut of hazelnuts, and so this uh, chocolatier started grinding up hazelnuts and mix. And the, because Nutella is delicious, Chris. Wow. All right. The bad ones. Why do you hate Nutella? Yeah, I don't like it actually. <laughs> The bat bomb was going to be used. I think we have to wrap it. And it only got canceled because the, the nuke kind of overshadowed. It's like, well, it isn't even better. Anyway, all this stuff, all of that kind of stuff is going to be used. Comics you should be reading. Anything by Mike Mignola. You're I once made a mistake in a comic shop of saying I would read Mike Mignola if he did, did a the history of foot fungus and. Uh, the, one of the you know, said, I could make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> I, he said, I would not like to see you take a football game. Go, That's not the point. It's like anything, <laughs> anything he touches is going to be great, even if you were to write an answer of football games. Oh, I don't want to see that. Well, isn't that so? He's not going to He's not gonna write a thing of football games. I'm just saying, if he did, I would. Anyway, we all know that guy at our local comic shop. Yeah, uh, we gotta stop. No, we have to stop. No, I was gonna say, but there is stuff for Final Flux. All right, it's all right. Final Flux. All right. Yeah, let's know, you know. Uh, and plus, Matt's gonna go to the bathroom. I really, really bad. Really um, so you can make it up on run. My final thought is gonna be quick. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed working with Bill on Fables, and I'm kind of sad because I feel like it's probably the last Fables related thing that we're gonna do. Uh -huh. um, but it's been really great. Being involved in it, and that's a real. And one thing, one thing that we have not mentioned is that Matt and I both have careers in comics because because of Bill. Oh, Bill. That yes. very nice. Yeah. Very nice. We do. That's okay. 
I can prove with math that's not true. Uh, it, it's going to take a while. Um, yeah, all right, no, we got to show you work. Listen, listen. listen. The talent is going to, to play out. I got a lot of my first chances by people who just said, like, this guy can, can do it. And, and there was no reason those people needed to do that. I mean, part of, of being in this business and, and all that, and it's not altruistic at all. It's, it's what other guys can do stuff. Um, you know, you guys had to get work because, because Shelly was going to go elsewhere. Uh, if I couldn't, you know, pull out people that could do this that, that I wanted to. Sure. So yeah, it's, it, it's it's I owe my career to whatever is is always it's very complimentary. Thank you, but it's always wrong in the particulars uh, or in the in the macro sense. So and well, I I say obviously based on these thirteen years continue to follow these uh, gentlemen in, in, in their new projects. And oh, speaking them. of which, yeah, uh, I, have a, I have a new project called Public Relations. It's coming out on the 23rd, uh, which is not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after next. I would love it if you guys would ask your local comic shop to order it and pick it up if it's there. Um, Who's through? This is from Double Stew, first comment. Double this is right. co-written by me and Dave Justice. It's, something, it's a book we've literally been working on for the past seven years. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a funny, funny book. Um, it has great art by David Hahn, uh, beautiful covers by Annie Wu, um, and I think if you enjoyed uh, Jack of Fables at all, this is a book you should really consider getting. Excellent. I read the first five and perhaps more. How many exist now? There, there are 13. 13. So read the first five. Yeah, and it is it is hilariously funny. Um, there's at least one joke in one of those issues, I think five, that's gonna throw both Matt and Dave in jail. So get this, it's gonna be a collector's item uh, once they're doing time for, for bad thought. Uh, it's, not, it's not technically illegal, we'll get yelled at. Yeah, anyway, it is, it is a wonderful book. Um, I've got three new, very small comic projects, meaning they're not gonna be 150 issues coming out. I'm not gonna mention the name of either because I'm having really bad luck keeping an artist going on this, uh, um, apparently I got spoiled. Uh, Bucky stayed for 13 years, and I forgot that others don't do that. Uh, but when the time comes, you should read them. And Chris is writing uh, everything in Hellboy. I'm technically co-writing, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, Hellboy, the BPRD, um, Mike, it's not been officially announced, but Mike is talking to interviews about the fact that I'm doing Wishfinder too. And uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that uh, hasn't been announced. And we're going to talk more about uh, Chris's work tomorrow in a solo panel. It's out there as a Colin Bunn panel, but Colin couldn't be there. And as I said earlier, oh, uh, so I'm like, hey, let's do a let's do a Chris panel because of everything that's going on, not just Ice Zombie and BPRD, but a lot of other things as well. So you can learn more tomorrow with us. But uh, no, seriously, great time. Thank you for your patience and your attention. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your kind work.